Hello there, folks, and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Global Summit 12 presentation of The Iron Lady on Screen, discussing Margaret Thatcher in film and on TV. I'm Ben Spagan. I'm the Vice President at the JES. In this program, which originally aired live on Friday, May 14th, 2021, I discussed Lady Thatcher and the on-screen portrayals of her with Dr. Niall Gardner, who served as an aide to the former British Prime Minister and is the director of the Thatcher Center for Freedom at the Heritage Foundation. We also discussed the unifying power of cinema. Before we get to the program, I'd like to thank all of our event sponsors, Erie Insurance, Erie News Now, the Erie County Gaming Revenue Authority, WQLN Public Media, and the American Tapestry Project, and our Global Summit event partner, the City Club of Cleveland. And I'd like to remind you that you can access additional programs to stream on demand at jesery.org, where you'll find a wide range of publications from reports, essays, timely writings, and more. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all JES content. And now, here's the Iron Lady on screen, discussing Margaret Thatcher in film and on TV. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome back to the Jefferson Educational Society, Niall Gardner, director of the Heritage Foundation's Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. Before I go any further, I'm just going to repeat what Ben and I were chatting about. I'd like to thank Dr. Gardner for hosting several of the Jefferson's Rainey Fellows at a luncheon in Washington in the spring of 2019, when he quite candidly discussed Brexit, which was a, a live issue at that time, explaining to the fellows the issue's many nuances. We look forward to visiting him again with our current Ramey Fellows. Dr. Gardner's key areas of specialization include the Anglo-American special, special relationship, the United Nations post-war Iraq, the role of Great Britain and Europe in the US-led alliance against terrorism and rogue states. On an interesting side note, he was recently named one of the 50 most influential Britons in the United States by the London Daily Telegraph. As a leading authority on transatlantic relations, Dr. Gardner has advised the executive branch of the US government on a range of issues. His policy papers are widely read on Capitol Hill. He appears not only at the Jefferson, but he appears frequently as a foreign policy analyst and political commentator on national and international television and radio, including Fox News, CNN, BBC, Sky News, and NPR. As he concludes this first week of Global Summit 12, Dr. Gardner will be making his third Global Summit appearance, having previously presented at Global Summits 7 and 11. Tonight, he'll be discussing The Iron Lady on Screen, Margaret Thatcher in Film and TV. This is a really an important topic, Phil. It's an important topic because media representations of prominent historical figures often distort their accuracy, leaving audiences with a misperception and misunderstanding of what actually happened. Its importance has only grown in our media-saturated culture. As a result, getting the story straight has become increasingly important. In fact, I'd like to make the opinion that it's become critically important as we try to navigate today's cancel culture, trying to sort out fact from fiction between those who would whitewash history and those who on the woke left seek to ferret out every misstep anyone ever made anywhere. So as a student of history, I'm eager to hear Dr. Gardner's general insights about, about history, about history and media and pop culture. But as an avid fan of The Crown and having seen The Iron Lady, I'm also interested in his insights into Gillian Anderson and Merle Streep's portrayals of the former prime minister. Dr. Gardner is particularly qualified for this discussion, having served as a foreign policy aide to the late prime minister, assisted her with her last book, Statecraft Strategies for a Changing World, and advised her on a number of international issues. Dr. Gardner, welcome to Global Summit 12. Thank you, Dr. Roth. And thanks again to uh, Erie Insurance and to all of our sponsors and our event partner, the City Club of Cleveland, for helping to make tonight's event and the rest of the JES's Global Summit 12 possible. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roth. Dr. Gardner, welcome, welcome, welcome back to the JES's Global Summit stage, your third appearance. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Ben. It's absolutely great to, to be here. And thank you very much to Andrew for that very kind uh, in, introduction. And it's always a tremendous pleasure to, to speak to the Jefferson Educational Society. Uh, and it's a real uh, honor to be here this evening. Thank you very much. And, and you're so welcome. And, and one of the things that uh, I appreciate, aside from uh, your political acumen and, and scholarship, is that you are an avid cinephile. And that's one of the things you and I connected over in, in your first trip here. And so before we get into The Iron Lady on screen, uh, both large and small, I, I want to ask you about film broadly and, and, and focus on the power of cinema. Uh, because, you know, while we oft, uh, you know, often hear the word divided country, yet it, you know, we still seem to 
share a collective delight in gathering around screens, big and small, to witness stories being told. How do you see the impact of the unifying power of cinema today? Well, that, that's a great uh, point and a very timely one, uh, Ben, because, uh, of course, we're all eager to go back to the, to the cinema. And in fact, I think that, you know, now that I'm you know, fully vaccinated for, for COVID, um, one of the first things I'm going to do is actually go back to the cinema. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of the, a lot of the big releases uh, later this year. And as you mentioned, I think that, you know, cinema plays such a hugely important role not only here in the United States, but across the world. In fact, I think it's one of the few things that really unites uh, America, it unites the world, rather than divides America, divides the world. And I think that cinema has this enormous uh, power. It has the, the power to you know, transport us to, uh, you know, to a different world, to different times in history, whether you know, we're, we're landing on the beaches of, of Normandy in, in Steven Spielberg saving Private Ryan, uh, or uh, going, you know, going back in time to, you know, the Battle of uh, Rourke's Drift uh, in 1879 in South Africa, and you know, cinema has this incredible, incredible uh, power actually, uh, and it has the power to inspire, it has the power to uplift the human spirit, uh, and it also has has the power, I think, to tackle a lot of the, you know, the biggest issues of our of our time, uh, and and I think that. You know, as a medium, there is nothing more powerful uh, than than the world of of cinema, actually. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I think cinema is is just an immensely positive and and powerful uh, force for not only for the United States but for uh, for free nations across the world. It's also, of course, a source of inspiration for those who don't live in free nations, uh, who who look to to cinema to inspire and. And American popular culture, especially cinema, plays such a huge role, uh, I, I think, in inspiring those who don't live in free societies. Uh, and, and the power of American cinema uh, is, is absolutely, uh, absolutely immense. And, and right to that point, I, I can't help but think most recently of Nomadland and the fact that uh, now an Academy Award winning director, her acceptance speech was not aired in China and in, in her native country. Yes. Uh, and, and yet we have the environment here to have that film on display, these conversations being had uh, and, and really celebrating that. And I, and I think that points to, I think, also the political power of cinema and, and being able to celebrate that here in, in the United States. And as you said, in other free countries throughout the world. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very important point you raised there. And it's significant that China did not broadcast the latest Oscars because uh, the director of Nomadland, Chloe Zhao, uh, is, a, is a Chinese national who left the country several years ago and has spoken in very uh, you know, fond terms about the United States. Uh, and, and so you know, the Chinese Communist Party feared the power of, of a Chinese director who actually has a pro-American outlook. Uh, and, uh, and Nomadland, in many respects, is a very beautiful film. It's not a political movie in any way, but but it, it's a very moving uh, film. It, it's a, a beautifully photographed film. It has a great soundtrack, tremendous performances. Frances McDormand deservedly won Best Actress for her, her portrayal. Uh, and it, it's a film actually that can uh, speak universally. And it's already a big hit now across the Atlantic uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and I hope that you know, eventually uh, the Chinese people will be able to see uh, Nomadland. Uh, made by a, a Chinese director who won, um, you know, the Best Director Academy Award. And, and I, I couldn't agree more with the praise for that film. It was one of my favorite films uh, this Oscar season. And, and I think that this is uh, indicative of film's power to open us to political conversations beyond what we see on screen and, and to have those kinds of dialogues of uh, what it means to be able to speak freely, what it means to be able to show something freely and what it means to be able to do that. Because like you said, it's not a political film. Um, I almost uh, enjoy it more for a seemingly uh, plotless narrative of just watching characters and watching their story unfold, not tremendously plot driven, but just wonderful acting, wonderful cinematography and, and shot so well. So that helps us have these conversations. I do want to turn in because we were talking about the Iron Lady on screen. I want to turn there and, and look at some of the drama there because The Crown uh, presents a, a rather confrontational 
dynamic between the Queen and Margaret Thatcher. You, uh, I, I can't think of anybody positioned better to A, talk about film and, and to talk about uh, the Iron Lady on film together here. You knew her so well. What was their relationship like in reality between Margaret Thatcher and the Queen? Yes, and uh, in fact, I just finished um, re-watching uh, season four of, of The Crown. Uh, and it is incredibly well made. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that the, you know, the, the production design, the acting, uh, the script writing, it's all uh, incredibly well done with, with the crown. Uh, but the, the depiction of, of Margaret Thatcher, the depiction of the queen, certainly is very controversial. It's divided a lot of critics. Uh, there, are, there are many who hate the portrayal of, of Margaret Thatcher in the crown. There are many who hate the portrayal of, of the Queen. There are others who, uh, who admire the portrayal of Margaret Thatcher and, and the Queen in The Crown. And ultimately, season four is really the story of, uh, of the Queen, played by Olivia Colman, uh, Margaret Thatcher, played by Gillian Anderson, uh, and then more broadly as well, the story of uh, Princess Diana, played by Emma Corrin, and, and the story of Prince Charles as well. So, so that, that's really at the heart of, of season four. Uh, but, you know, the central dynamic certainly is the, uh, is the relationship between Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister in the 1980s, uh, and Queen Elizabeth II. And that's really the central dynamic uh, of, of The Crown. Uh, and I think the, you know, the, the filmmakers of The Crown, for the sake of uh, entertainment, certainly have created a rather almost sort of adversarial dynamic between uh, the two most powerful women in the world at that, that, that time. Uh, and let's not forget that, you know, Margaret Thatcher won three general elections in a row. She never lost a general election. She was ousted by the, the left wing of the, the Conservative Party known as the Wets, but she never lost a, a general election, an absolutely formidable figure, the first uh, woman British prime minister. Uh, and then you had, of course, the, you know, the, the Queen uh, in place who was born just a few months after Margaret Thatcher, they're almost the same age. Uh, and you had this extraordinary situation where you had a female British Prime Minister meeting regularly uh, with, the, uh, with the Queen. And so the Crown goes into that dynamic and it paints uh, an often sort of almost adversarial uh, relationship between, between the two. And, you know, the, the reality is that Margaret Thatcher, I know this from having worked closely with her for several years, but Margaret Thatcher was a, a monarchist at heart. She was a big admirer of, of the Queen. Uh, and uh, clearly, I think as Prime Minister, there were some differences between Margaret Thatcher and, uh, and the Queen. We saw that uh, illustrated with regard to the disagreements over, uh, over the Commonwealth and sanctions against uh, what was then apartheid uh, South Africa. Uh, and I think that you know, the Crown does a fairly good job of, of actually illustrating that, that dynamic. But at the same time that the Crown uh, sort of presents a view, uh, a, portray a portrayal of the, of the royal family looking down upon Margaret Thatcher. And I think, in, uh, I think it's in episode uh, two of season four where, where Margaret Thatcher visits uh, the Queen's uh, estate in Scotland, Balmoral, and she has to undergo a series of, of tests uh, that, that are put forward by, by the royal family. Uh, and I think you know, a lot of what you see in that, in that episode is actually is made up. Uh, and you know, I think that the makers of the Crown certainly port portray the royal family as being nasty and vindictive towards Margaret Thatcher, which I don't think was the case whatsoever. And I think without a doubt, I mean, the Queen had tremendous respect for, uh, for, for Lady Thatcher. Uh, and I had the opportunity actually to meet with, uh, meet with the Queen at Lady Thatcher's 80th birthday party in London. The Queen very rarely attended uh, birthday celebrations of politicians. She made, made a point of attending Margaret Thatcher's 80th birthday uh, celebration. Uh, and, and also as, uh, as we saw in the final episode of, of season four, uh, after uh, Margaret Thatcher steps down uh, from the leadership of the Conservative Party, steps down as, as Prime Minister, uh, the Queen uh, summons uh, the Prime Minister 
uh, to Buckingham Palace. Uh, and the Queen um, emphasizes how much she and, and Margaret Thatcher actually have in common. And she presents uh, the Iron Lady with the Order of Merit, uh, which is an award that is very rarely given. The Queen has the personal right to give that, that award and she, she pins the medal on, on, on the Prime Minister. And that's a very moving scene at the end of, uh, of the Crown. And I think that's where the, the makers of the Crown get the dynamic between Margaret Thatcher and the Queen absolutely right. The mutual respect that was there between, between the two. Uh, and, and so I, I think that it's a very mixed picture with regard to, uh, you know, how, how the, the crown portrays this, this dynamic, that there's good and bad, I think, in, in how, how the, cr the crown uh, illustrates the relationship between the two, the two figures. And, and I'm glad you brought that scene up, Niall, because I, I, that is one of the, I, I think, most moving parts of season four is, is watching that exchange beautifully shot, uh, beautifully acted in, in, in such dialogue that's, that's sparse and, and hits so well in that. And I, I think that really captures as we watch the evolution of their relationship over, over the series. And I, I, I'm hardened to hear that that seems like the, the, uh, the directors and the writers got that right, because I, I, yeah. it's, it's just such a moving scene uh, that really captures Captured, captured my attention and, and really held me in, in that moment for a while. And I, and I think that speaks to the power of the series overall as we're watching history unfold and, and we're watching it told uh, dramatically. It, it's hard to argue that this, this has not been a success. The Crown has been widely successful. And, and I think it's demonstrated the huge interest in the British monarchy on both sides of the Atlantic uh, and, and that folks are interested in learning more about the monarchy and, and trying to understand it. And here we are understanding it through a television series. I can't help but ask current situations. Do you think that the hugely watched interview with between Oprah Winfrey and, and, and uh, Meghan Markle and, and Prince Harry is going to have an impact on the monarchy and how we view it. Uh, is it going to weaken the monarchy? Is, uh, will it not weaken the monarchy? What do you think will happen? And, and I know I'm asking you a question that's still unfolding in real time. And in fact, there was just a recent interview between Prince Harry and Dax Shepard on uh, his, his podcast talking about this more. So I know I'm asking you a question that's still evolving, but what's, yeah. what's the impact so far on both sides of the Atlantic? And where do you project that's headed? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a very important question as well, really, because, you know, raises a number of questions about the future of the uh, of the monarchy. And uh, and I did watch the the entire uh, Oprah Winfrey uh, interview. Uh, and, uh, you know, li like the crown, the Oprah interview was was basically, you know, a piece of grand entertainment. Uh, and uh, and I think that um, you know, the interview reached an audience, I think, in the United States alone of 20 to 30 million people, something like that, on a huge, a huge audience. And then globally, it was broadcast uh, as, as well. Uh, and it's interesting to see the impact on, on either side of the Atlantic. So I've closely followed the, the opinion polls in the UK on, on this issue. And I take a very close interest in the, uh, in the monarchy. And I am a, a very strong monarchist supporter myself. Uh, and what we found from the, the polling in the UK uh, is that following this interview, uh, the popularity of the, of the Queen has risen further in, in Great Britain. And so the Queen has a, an approval rating in the UK of, I think it's 80% or, or above. Uh, and the monarchy overall is, is backed by, I think, at least 70% of the British uh, population. And so the Queen's popularity has been enhanced further following the interview. Uh, and, and I think the popularity of uh, Prince William has also gone up, uh, also uh, with, with Kate Middleton uh, as well, her popularity has risen. Uh, the ratings for uh, Prince Harry and, and Meghan Markle have fallen significantly since the interview. So the, there was a big backlash in the British press against the interview. Uh, and and many, many Brits felt the interview was quite insulting towards the monarchy. Uh, and uh, and if you look especially at the ratings for Meghan Markle, I mean, they, they plummeted dramatically in the UK. Uh, Prince Harry, there's always respect, I think, for Prince Harry, especially because of his military service in Afghanistan and what he has done for, for veterans' causes in the UK. Prince Harry is always going to be, I think, loved by the British people, but, but even his ratings fell following this interview. 
Now, in, in the United States, there's also been some, some polling uh, as well. There's more sympathy on the US side for, for Meghan and Harry. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and every poll has shown this over the course of the last few decades, that there is very strong US support for the Queen. The Queen's very popular in America. She always gets approval ratings higher than any US president. Uh, and that, that included, uh, uh, you know, B Barack Obama, actually, when, when he was president, there was a poll taken back then. And the Queen had a higher rating, I think, 70 percent than than President Obama. So that, that's an extraordinary, uh, you know, situation. So the Queen is very popular in the UK. Um, but what you are seeing, I think, is that in, in America, certainly a younger, uh, you know, um, views Meghan in a more favorable light than their British counterparts. Uh, and so th there is a transatlantic divide over this, this particular issue. Uh, and I was struck by the, the very strong British backlash against the interview. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, which, which does, um, you know, raise, raise broader issues. Uh, and I think that if anything, in the UK, the monarchy is stronger following the, um, following the, uh, the, the, the interview, actually. And the British have closed ranks against what they perceive to be a tax on the, uh, on, on the monarchy itself. And, 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 and I know I'm asking you a really complex follow up, but if you can try to distill it as simply for, for us, a mostly American audience here beyond Erie County, we've had folks tuning in throughout the nation to these programs. And, uh, you know, we are broadcasting to the world. So there might be folks tuning in from England as well. But uh, help us Americans understand that support and loyalty to the monarchy, why the nation is still so called to this form of government and still has that reverence and respect for the queen and the family. Yes, and um, you know, I think on, it's striking on both sides of the Atlantic, um, just how much uh, goodwill there is towards the, uh, you know, towards the monarchy. Of course, you would expect that in, in the United Kingdom, uh, but you know, you, you see it, uh, very strongly here in the United States uh, as well, and and the, the Queen is is widely admired and loved uh, in in a nation that you know just over two hundred fifty years ago had a minor disagreement with with Britain over you know over, over British rule at that time uh, and uh, <laughs> minor disagreement <laughs> and that now we're the best of now we're the best of friends and but it is extraordinary that today there is there is so much ad admiration for. Uh, for the Queen in, in the United Kingdom. You rarely hear negative views expressed about the Queen in, in America. Uh, and the same could be said as well for the, uh, what used to be the British Commonwealth, now known as the Commonwealth of Nations. And it's a collection of 54 countries that are former parts of the British Empire. Uh, and uh, when Prince Philip passed away uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a huge outpouring of, of, uh, of sympathy and grief across the Commonwealth. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I was struck by the, uh, you know, the tremendous uh, messages of sympathy that came from, uh, you know, all, all across Africa, actually, uh, former parts of the British Empire, uh, and, and tremendous, uh, you know, sympathy for, for the Queen. And so it, it is striking, actually, just how, just how hugely popular the Queen is uh, across, across the world. And uh, e even in France, which, which has the, you know, some of the most anti-British sentiment anywhere in the world, you know, the Queen is popular there as well. So, um, and um, so uh, I, I, I do find that, you know, here in the United States, uh, that, uh, you know, there's this tremendous fascination with, with the monarchy and, and that's reflected in, the, in the, the huge viewing audience for The Crown. The Crown is one of the most successful television series ever broadcast in the United States. Uh, and, and, you know, that's a testament of the fact that, you know, there's a big audience in America for anything relating to, uh, to the monarchy, whether it's, it's watching uh, the crown going back, you know, uh, several decades, or whether it's watching an interview with, between Meghan Markle and Prince Harry and, and Oprah Winfrey. There's this tremendous uh, fascination and overall, I think, tremendous goodwill here in the United States towards the, uh, the Queen. And that, that's a testament to the leadership of the Queen, you know, over the course of, of nearly seven decades as, as monarch. I mean, she has been in many ways, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the leader of the free world, actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
and that that's you know a tremendous credit goes to the queen for her for her her leadership and i think that that's one of the dynamics that uh, is captured well on screen with the crown is the position of not having a position for the for the queen and, and i'm painting with a very broad brush there stating that but then having to take on political challenges and enemies and work through conflict with the prime minister the role of the prime minister and all of this and i i suppose taking the flack as it comes in and one of the things that I, I appreciate about uh, the Crown's uh, showing of uh, Lady Thatcher is uh, her humble background, uh, that before she goes on to Oxford, uh, she's working uh, in her father's grocer shop. Um, they show her then, and I think they, they translate that well, clashing um, uh, with the upper class of the Conservative Party. And so I want to ask you, how accurate is that? How did yeah. uh, Thatcher's modest upbringing influence her leadership style as as prime minister? Yeah, yeah, uh, th that that's a really you know important point there because um, that that's a central feature of the you know of the crown, and I think it's a feature that they largely get right. Actually, I mean, I you know I have criticisms of many aspects of of the uh, the Netflix series. Um, but I think that's something actually the, the makers of the crown do get absolutely right. So Margaret Thatcher came from a very humble background. She was a greengrocer's daughter. She worked in her father's, father's grocer's shop before winning a scholarship to, to Oxford, uh, where she studied chemistry. Uh, and, and so you know, Margaret Thatcher did not come from a, a typical upper class background that one would find uh, typically for the uh, you know the leadership of the of the conservative party and, and e even today actually if you look at the you know the leadership of the the conservative party there there are, there are many uh, leading figures in the conservative party Boris Johnson included who come from a very upper class uh, background there there are others who don't but but you know the conservative party certainly when Margaret Thatcher was breaking into the ranks um, was dominated by, of course, um, all men, well, certainly all men at that time, and also, uh, of course, by, uh, by individuals who came from the upper, from the upper classes. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the Crown certainly gets that, you know, gets that, that right. I mean, she was someone from a, uh, from a very modest background, won a scholarship to Oxford. Uh, I can relate to that. I mean, I, I went to Oxford myself. It did not come from an upper class uh, background. I went to a regular uh, state school uh, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and, uh, you know, so Margaret Thatcher, uh, through her own, completely her own merit, um, you know, broke a number of glass ceilings uh, in, the, in the UK in a highly stratified society. Uh, you know, you think back to the 1950s and 1960s, then into the 1970s when she became the, the leader of the opposition, and then in 1979 as prime minister. Uh, and it was, you know, unheard of uh, for the Conservative Party in that era for, for someone to be able to break down all those, those barriers. And she did that. And the Crown gets that, that right. And Margaret Thatcher never forgets her, her humble origins, her humble roots, and she is always clashing with the, the sort of the elites of the Conservative Party who are still looking down upon her when she's prime minister. And she has to fight those battles uh, against, uh, you know, the, the upper classes of the Conservative Party, even as the prime minister. And, and Dr. Gardner, I want to go right at one of the audience questions that goes right at that. This person's bringing up that uh, they, they can't help but notice in uh, the crown that Thatcher is shown making dinner for MPs and politicians. Is that an accurate depiction? Did, and did she pursue something with her, her homemade dinners, you know, uh, instead of a calling of a caterer? But I think we're looking at that of the fact that uh, inviting her, you know, inviting these other politicians into her house as a woman, and yet she's busy in the kitchen preparing dinner for them yeah. and, and, and doing that. And I think that's a struggle in, in what you just addressed, breaking through those glass ceilings. You know, was that accurate? And how did she handle that? Uh, and, and really to set the pace for being the first woman prime minister for Great Britain. Yeah, yeah, great, great audience question there. And, um, you know, I think actually the Crown gets that, that right. Because uh, so in Downing Street, which is a real sort of warren of, of, uh, of rooms over several floors, the Prime Minister does have a, have a flat as well in uh, number 10 uh, and with, with its own kitchen. And so, uh, yes, I'm Margaret Thatcher would like to do, 
you know, a lot of her own cooking. And sometimes she would uh, entertain her, her cabinet uh, and she would cook. Uh, and that, that's just, you know, who she was. I mean, she would just roll up her sleeves and get things done. She wouldn't wait for other people to do things for her. Uh, and, you know, uh, let's not forget, I mean, as, as, a, as a teenager, uh, you know, she was, uh, she was working in her, her father's grocer's shop, often sweeping the floor and, and so on. And she did a lot of very humble, menial tasks. And so, uh, so as, as prime minister, um, you know, and, and as, as a real leader, she would, she would roll up her sleeves and she would do whatever was, was, was needed. And that included, you know, if, if she wanted to cook a meal in her own uh, apartment in Downing Street, she would do that. Uh, and, uh, and so she was uh, not just the prime minister, she was also, of course, a mother to her two uh, children, Carol and Mark, who, who I met many, uh, many times. Uh, and uh, and she was the wife of of, uh, of Dennis Thatcher, DT, as, as he was known. And so, um, you know, she was she was a very down to earth person. I think the Crown actually reflects that that well. Uh, and uh, and I think that um, you know she was she was somebody who uh, was uh, you know was always willing to to roll up her own sleeves and actually uh, you know she worked incredibly hard. The Crown also gets that right. Incredibly hardworking person. She famously slept only about four or five hours a night as, as Prime Minister. Uh, she was always reading all of the, uh, the documents that she had, uh, and she, uh, she was incredibly well informed. Uh, and and that's, that's actually a real exception, frankly, for, you know, for a, a Prime Minister. A Prime Minister actually reads every single document. That's a rarity. She's an incredibly hardworking person, and she was very much like that when I when I worked for her after she was uh, prime minister. But she was still very active in public life, uh, even at a very uh, elderly age. She was incredibly hardworking, uh, and and she was always you know, reading reading books, reading uh, her briefing papers, uh, working on speeches, uh, and uh, you know she she always actually did her homework for any, any, uh, any kind of political event. Uh, and, uh, you know, th there were no airs or graces about Margaret Thatcher, you know. She, uh, she, she was truly a, you know, a woman of the, of the people who, and, and that's why the British people loved her, an extremely down to earth uh, person. And, and so I want to use uh, something that's captured in The Crown, uh, as well as The Iron Lady, uh, to talk about uh, two different portrayals and ask for uh, whether or not the filmmakers got Thatcher's leadership and instincts right. The Falkland Wars, uh, it's featured prominently in both The Crown uh, yeah. and The Iron Lady. Um, let's start with The Crown, since we've been there and, and we've been focused on that. Uh, did they get her leadership and instincts right? And then let's turn to uh, The Iron Lady with Meryl Streep's performance and to say, uh, did they get it right there? Yes. Yeah, so uh, starting with, you know, with, with The Crown uh, and, and The Falklands War actually features heavily in, in The Crown and also in The Iron Lady film with Meryl Streep. Um, I think that uh, you know the crown does get her leadership actually spot on on, on the Falklands issue, uh, and you know the Falklands is a British overseas territory. It was invaded by uh, by Argentina. Argentina took uh, two thousand British uh, citizens hostage, uh, and and the Falkland Islands are eight thousand miles away from the United Kingdom. Uh, they're just a few hundred miles off the coast of Argentina. And at that time, Argentina was led by a, a fascist dictatorship, a military junta, basically. And when Argentina invaded the Falklands, which at that time was not well protected at all, um, in fact, the, the British underestimated, I think, the threat that Argentina posed. And so the, the Argentines took the Falklands. And Margaret Thatcher made a decision almost immediately uh, to send a task force 8,000 miles across the world to retake the islands. That task force sailed within 48 hours of the order given. Uh, and, and the Crown actually rightly uh, shows that uh, most of her own cabinet opposed uh, sending a task force. That they, they thought it would be impossible to, to retake the Falklands. And, and let's not forget that when Margaret Thatcher took over Britain in 1979, Britain was known as the sick man of Europe. It had been under socialist domination for many, many years. Britain nearly went bankrupt in 1977 under the Labour government. 
uh, and Britain had to go to the IMF for a loan. And so when she took, uh, took over Britain, the nation was nearly bankrupt. And she turned the economy around and she also rebuilt Britain's military uh, capacity as well. And so to launch a military task force to sail across the other side of the world was an incredibly courageous thing to do. And it took real guts and leadership uh, and very few members of her own government actually believed it was possible to retake the islands. Uh, and uh, so she launched the task force. Uh, it, it sailed across the world, took several weeks to get to the Falklands. There was a bitter uh, fought uh, war for, se for several, several weeks to retake the, uh, the islands. Uh, I think uh, over 200 British servicemen died uh, in, that, in that war, but ultimately the British prevailed. And Margaret Thatcher, uh, you know, demonstrated tremendous courage and leadership and resolve in launching the Falklands War. Uh, and so the Crown does get that absolutely uh, right. Uh, the Iron Lady film with Meryl Streep also gets that right. And I think it's one of the best scenes of the, um, in the Iron Lady film, um, which was released several years before season four, The Crown. Uh, I think the Falklands scenes are very well done. And there's actually a scene in, in the Iron Lady uh, film where um, Margaret Thatcher is asked whether uh, a British nuclear submarine should sink uh, an Argentine cruiser known as the, or uh, called the Belgrano, actually. And the, the Belgrano uh, was Argentina's biggest cruiser. It has several hundred men on it. And uh, Margaret Thatcher had to make a snap decision whether to sink the Belgrano she took the decision to sink the ship. Uh, it it's, was the only, uh, I think, uh, use of a, of a nuclear submarine uh, in, in, in warfare in modern times, as far as, I, uh, as, far as I'm aware. Uh, and she took down the, the Belgrano, uh, which was uh, a hugely controversial decision at the time. And it went down with several hundred uh, men on board. Uh, and, uh, and that was the, the scene in, in the Iron Lady actually film is very well done about that, where she makes a decision and she says, sink it, uh, which is, you know, which is exactly the, the style of, of Margaret Thatcher. She didn't, you know, she didn't, um, uh, you know, make decisions upon what other people may think. She, she placed the British national interest and the safety of, of British servicemen first. And she made a decision to sink a battleship, which is a huge, huge uh, decision that no leader has done in the Western world uh, since, uh, you know, since World War II. And, and so, Dr. Garner, I hear you saying the Falklands, they get it right. Uh, her humble upbringings, they get it right. Uh, an audience yeah. question here is asking, um, uh, since you know her so well, uh, what is one point of Margaret Thatcher's life? personality, politics, et cetera, that you wish would have been included in the crown? Yeah, that's, that, that is a, a tremendous uh, question, actually. And, um, you know, um, it, it's, it's an important uh, question. And, and I think that, um, you know, I think what the crown misses really um, is a, a clear, a, a greater sense of the the huge achievement of Margaret Thatcher's leadership. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, when Margaret Thatcher became prime minister, Britain was a nation in terrible decline. Uh, and it was a nation that had become almost a laughing stock in the world because it had to go with a begging bowl to the IMF. And years of socialist misrule had basically bankrupted uh, Britain. And so it was a nation with no self-confidence. Uh, and uh, and it, was, it, was, it was seen as, a, as an economic basket case. Uh, and so what the Crown does, it focuses upon certainly the high levels of unemployment that you see in, in early 1980s Britain. There's an episode which shows uh, a um, sort of down and out, um, uh, you know, painter, decorator, uh, a figure, Michael Fagan, and this is this is a true story where you know who actually breaks into Buckingham Palace not just once but twice, and and ends up actually in the Queen's bedroom, uh, and this is actually true what happened there, 
And, and the Crown sort of then um, imagines a fictional conversation between Michael Fagan and, and the Queen, where uh, Fagan starts to uh, blame Thatcherism, the ideology of Thatcherism, for the fact that he, you know, he's basically out of a job, he's getting unemployment benefit, he can't get any work. And, and in this completely fictional portrayal of the conversation, um, uh, in fact, we, we don't know at all actually what was said between Fagan and, and, and the Queen, I think very little actually, other than the Queen basically calmly telling him to, to, to get out of the room. But the Crown has this fictional conversation where he basically gives this sort of rant against Thatcher's rule and the Queen is actually shown to be sympathizing with what he's saying. Now, um, you know, which is, which is a, a complete sort of, uh, in my view, fabrication of, of reality. And, and the fact is that, you know, the vast majority of British people were, were better off as a result of the Thatcher years, because ultimately more jobs were created, inflation was brought under control, millions of Britons were able to buy their own uh, homes, uh, and, and the United Kingdom turned from being the sick man of Europe into the economic powerhouse of Europe. And today, if you look at the UK, I mean, the UK is the most dynamic, uh, strongest economy in, in, in Europe. Uh, and, you know, and that's the direct result of Margaret Thatcher's uh, leadership. And we, you don't get any sense of that from, you know, from the crown. And Margaret Thatcher rescued Britain from being a nation on its knees into, uh, into once again, a sort of global power. And the United Kingdom today is an immensely self-confident nation. It's once, it's once again, it's the world's fifth largest economy. Uh, it's a very dynamic uh, country. Uh, and that's in large part due to the reforms that Margaret Thatcher brought in. But you wouldn't get any sense of that from watching The Crown, which is, you know, the, the makers of The Crown, you know, Peter Morgan and his colleagues are, are not known for their conservative views. And they have an ax to grind against Thatcherism. Uh, and and the you know the economic ideology of Thatcherism, the free market ideology of it, and they make that very clear in, in the film. But ultimately, however, I think that if you look at all of the scenes of Margaret Thatcher and the Crown, ultimately, I think that you know the portrayal of Margaret Thatcher is more uh, sympathetic than negative, actually. And, and I think that a neutral observer would come away from the Crown having a more positive overview of Margaret Thatcher than perhaps the makers of the crown set out originally to achieve. Um, and, and so, so that, that's my main criticism of, of the crown is they, you know, there's a certain sort of amount of politicking going on where they're attacking Thatcher's ideology and blaming Thatcher for economic ills. And, you know, the, the economic ills of Britain faced that are the result of socialism uh, in the 1970s and not Margaret Thatcher's uh, ec economic policies. And so uh, thank you for that. And I want to turn uh, to an audience question again. And uh, here we are talking about Thatcher on film. And this person's asking, uh, was Lady Thatcher a fan of film? And if so, what was her favorite? Yeah, uh, yeah I lo love that question. Um, actually, you know, Margaret Thatcher, interesting enough, was, was not, a, um, not a film fan. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, she... <laughs> She made a point of not watching The Iron Lady when it came out, which, which came out in, uh, I think, back in 20, uh, 2011. Uh, she passed away in 2013. Uh, I, I know for a fact she didn't watch The Iron Lady. And, and she, she actually didn't like to, to see herself depicted on, on screen. So she didn't enjoy watching herself on the news, for example. She was, though, a very avid reader of newspapers. And uh, when I worked for her, she, she would read several newspapers every day. Her favorites were certainly the, um, the Telegraph, uh, the, the Times, the Daily Mail she read. And she would actually write all over them with a, with, with a pen. Uh, and, and she, uh, in fact, would write all over books as well. Uh, so she was a, a great reader. She wasn't actually someone who watched um, uh, a lot of films or television. But she read a lot of a lot of books, and um, and I still recall today my my job interview for Margaret Thatcher um, when I was a uh, you know I just graduated from uh, from Yale with a with a PhD in history, uh, and uh, and I was called in for an interview with with the Iron Lady, which is quite daunting. Uh, but she 
you know, she was incredibly friendly, uh, very, very warm. Uh, and um, and I'd men I mentioned to her that, um, you know, my, uh, my PhD uh, thesis supervisor was Paul Kennedy, who's also a British uh, historian. And, uh, and she said, oh, yes, Paul Kennedy, I, I, I read his book, you know, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't agree with the book, she said, but, but I thought it was a very interesting book. She then went, uh, went uh, li literally down on her uh, hands and knees, rummaging through a bookcase to find the book, The Rise and Fall of Great, the Great Powers by my uh, former supervisor, Paul Kennedy. She then pulled out a copy of the book and then she showed it to me. And she had actually marked up uh, multiple pages of the book. She'd written all over it. Uh, and, and she knew the book in detail. Uh, and that, that was Margaret Thatcher for you, uh, somebody who paid tremendous attention to detail. She didn't always agree with, with everything she read, but she loved debating ideas. And, and she, she liked debating uh, ideas with her opponents as well. And that, that was, you know, there's so much, I think, that modern day politicians can learn from her because, you know, she always enjoyed intellectual debate uh, with, with people who didn't uh, agree with her. Uh, so she was a great reader, uh, and, uh, but, uh, but I have to say she was not actually a, a sort of cinema goer and she, she hated watching herself on, you know, on screen. And so she probably, you know, I doubt she would actually, actually watch The Crown if she was still with us uh, today. So. And uh, thank you for that. And I, 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 I love now that we have the image of her rummaging around to find this book by Paul Kennedy. And uh, for those tuning in watching this program, a bit of Global Summit trivia, Paul Kennedy was featured at Global Summit 3 by the JES. So we've actually had him on the JES stage as well. Um, fun, fun bit of trivia I wanted to toss in here. Before going back to the audience questions to ask another one, Niall, we're looking at some contemporary issues. And, and I want to turn in a minute because I wanted to ask you about Brexit because we had brought you in last time for Global Summit to talk about Brexit. And I wanted to ask what Thatcher would have thought about Brexit. But this audience question is actually asking about the EU. Uh, and this person saying that uh, initially she was a supporter of European integration in the EU and supported the referendum of membership in the uh, EC in 1975. But uh, by the end of her term was an opponent of European centralization. Can you talk a little bit more about her evolution and thought on British membership? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm glad that... Um... A member of the audience has, has raised that question because, you know, Brexit has been the dominant political issue for the United Kingdom for, for the last decade. Uh, and um, when I worked for Lady Thatcher in a private office, uh, I assisted her with her final book, which is called Statecraft Strategies for a Changing World, which was really her foreign policy book. And it outlined her big picture views on, on British leadership on the world stage. And also it outlined her views about the future of Europe. Now, um, Statecraft, which was a best-selling a book uh, in, in the UK, was I think the number one bestseller on the Sunday Times list in London for about five or six weeks. Um, it was actually a very controversial book uh, that was even actually dis, you know, it was practically disowned by a lot of, uh, you know, um, people in the Conservative Party back then, because it was so controversial. Why was it controversial? It's because of Margaret Thatcher back in 2002, 14 years ahead of the 2016 Brexit referendum, spoke about the possibility of Britain leaving the European Union. So statecraft was the first call by a leading British politician for Britain to think about a future outside of the EU. Hugely controversial back then, unthinkable back then. In fact, it was written off as, you know, by some critics, absolutely ridiculous, the idea that Britain would ever leave the European Union. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I, I remember at the time the, the outrage that it sparked, um, you know, by, by the sort of pro-EU establishment. Now, if you fast forward uh, to David Cameron's premiership, uh, and, uh, you know, D David Cameron actually was, uh, was someone who, who Margaret Thatcher actually never liked. Uh, and, you know, David Cameron, when he became um, leader of the Conservative Party, Margaret Thatcher, I, I, I remember this well from a, from a dinner that, that I attended with, with the Iron Lady, and she was asked her view of David Cameron, and, and her response was, David who? Uh, and she pretended not, not, to, uh, not to, you know, 
uh, even even acknowledge who he was. Um, and uh, because, of course, David Cameron had had made it clear that he wanted the Conservative Party to abandon Thatcherism. Um, and and so, so David Cameron is a very pro-European, pro-EU figure who decided, in my view, fortunately, to hold a referendum on British membership of the European Union. He did so because there was tremendous pressure building from the UK Independence Party, which was led by Nigel Farage. And, and UKIP, as it was known back then, was surging in the polls. And so Cameron wanted to head that off by holding a referendum, which he thought he could win. Uh, he, he thought that the pro-EU side would win an overwhelming victory in the 2016 referendum. Now, when that referendum was held on June 23rd, 2016, and I was there in London at the time at the headquarters of Vote Leave, the campaign uh, for Brexit, uh, when the referendum was held, the UK voted 52 to 48 to leave the European Union. And that was actually the, uh, the legacy of Margaret Thatcher, because Margaret Thatcher was the first British politician to say, let's consider leaving the EU. So if she was alive at the time of the referendum, she would have wholeheartedly supported Brexit and she would have celebrated it, uh, no, no doubt with a, you know, with a bottle of champagne, uh, you know, based on, on the, the result, although M Margaret Thatcher did have a preference for uh, gin and tonic and whiskey, as we said. Um, but uh, she would have, you know, certainly had a, a bottle of champagne to celebrate. So, so Margaret Thatcher, if she was still with us today, would be a huge supporter of Brexit. Uh, and in many ways, Boris Johnson is the heir to her, her legacy. So, so I hope, hope that answers the, the question, because there's a lot of discussion about Thatcher's views on Brexit. But, uh, you know, I categorically say, having worked for her, that she, on numerous occasions that I spoke to her privately, she supported Britain leaving the European Union. And it's all there in, in Statecraft, which is a 2002 book about the origins of Brexit. So, so I highly commend that book to anyone who's interested in the origins of, of, of Brexit. And, and I'd point out we have a link available to that book on our website, jeserie.org, where you can find out more information about it and tonight's speaker. Uh, Dr. Gardner, I want to go back to the audience question. And uh, we either have someone uh, from England or somebody who attended Oxford. And, and earlier we talked about uh, Thatcher's uh, relationship with and uh, challenges with uh, uh, conservative elitists or conservative elites. And here I think we're turning attention to her relationship to higher education, because this person's asking uh, why Oxford had decided not to grant her an honorary degree yeah. and, and what that blow was for both her and for the institution. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, you know, that, that certainly brings back quite a few memories because I remember that well. So, um, Oxford University traditionally um, gives an honorary degree to uh, former prime ministers that have graduated from, from the university. And I think there are, there are, if I'm not mistaken, close to 30 prime ministers that have graduated from Oxford University. Uh, and, and Margaret Thatcher is arguably the most um, distinguished and famous of those, uh, of those prime ministers. Um, and, you know, I think only Winston Churchill really compares to Margaret Thatcher in greatness uh, and as, as a former prime minister, but, but Churchill did not go to, to Oxford. Um, and uh, Margaret Thatcher did. And Oxford University famously refused to grant her an honorary uh, degree. Now, as was her style, Margaret Thatcher didn't make any kind of fuss over this but a lot of her supporters were outraged over it in the 1980s. Uh, and, and the university uh, at, at the time, you know, back in the 1980s, was largely led by, by people who, uh, you know, who did not support Margaret Thatcher's agenda. Uh, and as is often the case, I think, in universities that ideologically they tend to be more on the left. And that, you know, that, that includes, includes Oxford, although, you know, within, within Oxford, uh, because of its collegiate system and, and it's divided up into over 30 different colleges, some colleges are, are more conservative than, than others and some are more liberal than others. And uh, certainly my, my old college, Oriel College, when I attended, it was a very conservative college. But the university as, as a whole uh, and the leadership of the university was more on the left. Uh, and so that was regarded as, as a disgraceful move by Oxford to single out Margaret Thatcher 
the first woman prime minister, won three general elections and she was denied an, uh, you know, an honorary uh, degree. Uh, and it was, it was quite a scandal at the time, but, but Margaret Thatcher didn't make a big issue out of it. Uh, and you know, she had bigger you know, issues to, I think, to deal with them than her uh, alma mater sort of snubbing her. Uh, but but I, I think that you know on a personal level certainly that 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 you know she was saddened by that decision. As a graduate of Oxford, she loved Oxford. She was a graduate of some of some of her college. Some of her college now has a scholarship named after Margaret Thatcher. So they have the Thatcher Scholarship, uh, and so she loved Oxford, and she always spoke very fondly of Oxford. She never actually said a bad word about Oxford uh, that I can recall, even though the university treated her very badly. Uh, when she was prime minister. I, I appreciate you for answering that. And I, I, if I'm recalling it correctly, I think the office had a clip that if they wish not to confer the honor, she's the last person that wishes to accept it. It was it was a, a pretty terse response in the moment, uh, but clearly it, we we can see that that would have an impact on her, and, and that that um, you know that, that might leave a taste. But uh, yet moving through that, but you mentioned in there Winston Churchill, and I want to pull that out for a second because I've got to ask you uh, because before we came on the program uh, when we had Dr. Andrew Roth with us, we were talking about. And he was uh, fawning over the, the talent of British actors. And here we're looking at Americans playing Brits. And so I've got to ask, because we see John Lithgow as Winston Churchill in The Crown, and then we see Gillian Anderson as Margaret Thatcher, and we see Mer Meryl Streep as, as Margaret Thatcher. What do you make of, uh, if you had to give them grades, maybe you don't give them grades, but what do you think of their performance of American actors taking on iconic, uh, uh, iconic Brits? Yeah, really, really interesting uh, question there, Ben. And you know, it, it's striking, you know, how many Brits there are who play American roles. And um, there are just, just so many British actors who have, who have won, you know, Academy Awards playing Americans. And one thinks, for example, of Daniel Day-Lewis playing Abraham Lincoln, you know. And, uh, um, and so it's just so common that... Um, you know, you have a lot of the icons of American history who are played by British, British actors uh, from, you know, from Lincoln to Martin Luther King. Uh, and uh, it's far less common to have Americans playing British figures. And so you mentioned John Lithgow, who did an amazing uh, job, actually, of portraying Churchill in, you know, season one of, of, of The Crown. And, and I'm just actually re-watching that now. Uh, and John Lithgow, uh, you know, is is really incredible in that in that in that role. Um, and you know, having seen Meryl Streep play uh, Thatcher three, you know, I saw I saw the Iron Lady three times. I just rewatched it. Um, Meryl Streep's performance is is incredibly good. She deserved to win Best Actress for that. Incredibly, I think Meryl Streep's only won Best Actress. Um, I think twice. I think she won it for Sophie's Choice as well in 1982. Uh, and um, she um, she's without a doubt the greatest actress of her generation. Uh, and I think that she deservedly won the best actress uh, in 2012 for the, the Iron Lady. Gillian Anderson's performance actually, you know, I, I think as well, uh, you know, what one can criticize aspects of The Crown, but the performance by Gillian Anderson is is actually stunningly good. And, you know, Charles Moore, the authorized biographer of Margaret Thatcher has written three volumes, excellent volumes, uh, wrote a piece in the Telegraph where, where he thought that Gillian Anderson performance was the best portrayal of Margaret Thatcher that he's seen. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are a number of, of uh, people who know Margaret Thatcher well, who have, who have spoken, uh, you know, um, in, in glowing terms of Gillian Anderson's performance. There are others who know Margaret Thatcher well who have condemned the performance. And so it's a very, very mixed um, reception that she's had. I, I have to say that, you know, overall, I'm not, I, I do think it's, it's, it's an amazing performance. Um, and I know she's won a number of awards uh, and she deserves to win those awards. Uh, one criticism though, Gillian Anderson, is that, you know, M Margaret Thatcher, as prime minister was was a lot more sort of energetic, I think, than than the the sometimes lethargic sort of uh, um, portrayal in in the Crown. And so, Gillian Anderson portrays Margaret Thatcher as though she were, you know, 
reaching 70 years old or something. She wasn't as prime minister. I mean, she, you know, she was around 55 when she became PM. She was 65 when she stepped down. Uh, and, you know, and I think that, you know, Margaret Thatcher was a lot more lively <laughs> than, you know, than Julian Anderson, Julian Anderson's sort of slow moving, you know, um, uh, poor, portrayal. But, but having said that, I mean, it's, it's an incredible performance. You can't take that away from, from Julian Anderson. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it, it is, it is amazing and it's very lifelike, uh, the, the, the performance. So, so that, that's my sort of overall assessment of, of that. I, I appreciate that, Niall. I'm going to sneak uh, another audience question in here. And then as we're almost nearing the end of our conversation, almost out of time, I'm going to have some quick hit questions for you sure. uh, before yeah. we say uh, goodnight for the end here. Uh, last audience question that I want to get to here is asking, um, you know, back to uh, Margaret Thatcher breaking through that glass ceiling and uh, operating in a male dominant world. That can seem at times like such a daunting experience. Did she have a mentor um, and, and does a person appear in the films that she she uh, she looks to for guidance? Um, and if they didn't, uh, who might that person be? Who was her mentor through this? Yeah, that's that's a that, that's a good that's a good question. And so you have a number of figures that that are portrayed in both the Iron Lady film uh, and in the and in the Crown, who acted as men mentors. And I think. Uh, one of them was was uh, Gordon Rees, who, uh, who you see prominently featured in in the Meryl Streep film. Um, and uh, you also you, you see composites of various uh, advisors uh, to to the Iron Lady. She, she had a, a number of uh, you know figures around her who advised her on on all sorts of uh, of issues from economic policy to, to social policy to foreign policy. So in the crown, one of the figures that you see very prominently featured is is Charles Pohl, who is a foreign policy advisor, uh, and uh, you know he's in a lot of scenes in in the crown. Um, I don't think all of those scenes are, are accurate time wise, uh, but uh, but certainly you know Lord Pohl was was a very prominent figure at at her, at her side on the foreign policy uh side and but but i think you know a number of the people you see see around her i mean are, are real figures as bernard ingham the press secretary who you see uh frequently featured in the um uh, in the crown but um but you know you don't you don't get uh, a fully sort of three-dimensional picture of the of the people around her all the focus is upon margaret thatcher herself and both the iron lady and and, and, and the crown. Uh, I would say this it was about the Iron Lady. Um, you know, the, the Iron Lady has an amazing performance by Meryl Streep. It is, though, on a much smaller scale than the crown. The crown is, is on a much vaster canvas. Uh, and, um, and I think the, you know, uh, the, the Iron Lady is a much smaller film. And, you know, I, I think that we would have been far better served by you know, a film by, you know, Steven Spielberg or something, you know, some epic uh, depiction of Margaret Thatcher's life, rather than what was in essence a very small film, really, The, the Iron Lady. The Crown has a much bigger sweep about it. So right after this, we're going to go lobby Spielberg to get a new movie idea. I love that. All right, quick hit questions for Dr. Niall Gardner before we sign off here. Uh, we're talking about cinema and, and we're talking about the power of it. So I've got to ask, what movie led you to fell in, fall in love with yeah. cinema? Yeah, uh, wonderful question. So the first memory I have of going to the cinemas was when my dad took me to see uh, the James Bond film, The Man with, Man with the Golden Gun, Roger Moore. That was my first cinema experience. And my dad is a big film uh, fan. Uh, and so I immediately, uh, you know, fell in love with the, with the whole sort of uh, world of cinema on the edge of my seat watching, uh, watching James Bond. Uh, and I've seen every single you know Bond film um, in in the cinema since uh, since the, the Man with the the, the Golden Gun. Uh, but other early films that I that I watched at a very young age that had a huge impression: Zulu, um, you know, the, the great depiction of the Battle of Rourke's Drift, eighteen seventy nine, uh, is is a truly great a great movie. Um, I watched at a very young age the film Barry Lyndon by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, which is, uh, you know, three-hour ep epic based on a Thackeray novel. It is a beautifully made uh, film. Uh, one of my one of my great favorite all-time films, Barry Lyndon. Um, and um, 
Uh, and so, you know, I, I recommend uh, very highly, if, if anyone hasn't seen Barry Lyndon or, or Zulu, I, I would highly commend both of them. And of course, uh, you know, all of the James Bond films are just absolutely <laughs> brilliant. And I'm going to go and see No Time to Die when it comes out in October. So a favorite director. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have a number of favorite directors. So um, starting off with, so Stanley Kubrick, uh, Barry Lyndon, 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, Full Metal Jacket, The Shining are all magnificent classics. And Kubrick is just so influential. Also, A Clockwork Orange, a groundbreaking film, 1971. Um, and, uh, but in addition to that, uh, Martin Scorsese, uh, I was just re-watching Taxi Driver. What an incredibly well-made film that is, 1976. Scandalously did not win Best Picture for that for that year. But if you look, you look at the great films of Scorsese, Goodfellas, uh, you know, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, more recently, The Departed, um, and The Irishman, magnificent films. But I also, also love uh, Steven Spielberg films, absolutely wonderful. Ridley Scott, uh, another great uh, director, but I have so many uh, favorites actually that I can't really identify just, just one single director. Okay. So the movie that you've rewatched the most at this point. Yeah. Um, again, so many films I watch over and over again, but there's some films that I've rewatched recently that, that I, I would um, mention. Uh, I recently watched uh, Dead Poets Society by Peter Weir, the Australian director, and one of Robin Williams' fame, uh, you know, best, best films. That is an incredibly inspiring film. Uh, and, you know, it is one of the most inspiring films ever made. The Dead Poets Society is so powerful. Um, I, I also uh, rewatch um, quite quite frequently um, uh, Blade Runner. I'm, I'm a science fiction uh, fan. Ridley Scott's 1982 film Blade Runner is an absolute classic. I've watched that about 20 times. Um, also on the science fiction side, uh, Ridley Scott's uh, Alien um, is, is a, a truly great movie, as, as is James Cameron's Aliens. Um, uh, also science fiction, the, the, the Road Warrior, George Miller, um, going back to 1981, 1982, is, is an, probably, in my view, the best action film ever uh, ever made. But, but uh, other classics that I always rewatch over and over again, um, Jaws, Steven Spielberg, 1975. I've watched it 20, 30 times. Uh, it never grows old. Uh, the Exorcist, uh, William Freakin, 1973, is an absolute classic. Uh, a film. Um, I also love uh, to, to re-watch whenever I can, uh, The Deer Hunter, Michael Cimino, 1978, Chariots of Fire, uh, 1981, um, Best Picture winner, uh, but th there are just so many <laughs> films. Th th those are some of my favorites, uh, Ben. And I was going to say The Deer Hunter, another wonderful performance from Meryl Streep, yes. uh, who we talked about yeah. earlier. All right, yeah. uh, preferred movie theater snack, are you a popcorn guy or a candy guy? Um, you know, I eat both actually, uh, I have to say Ch chocolate really is my, my, uh, my, my favorite. Um, and, uh, uh, I have to mention as well, actually, Ben, just quickly, you know, I rewatched the Godfather trilogy, uh, and what a fantastic set of, set of films. They just don't make films like that anymore, do they? And, and, uh, especially Godfather, uh, part two is just stunningly good. So, uh, just, just a great, great set of films. We could debate all night whether or not Godfather 2 is better than Godfather 1. I yes. think we could spend so much time on that. And then just <laughs> unpack Coppola. You know, I think, yeah. you know, Apocalypse Now is just yeah. a, a tremendously powerful movie in, in yes. that canon as well. You, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up um, uh, the fact that you you had published a, a, a top 10 list. Uh, you were blogging for The Telegraph uh, for yeah. a long time. Um, and you, you were you were making the case there of the top 10 conservative films in this list. And I think in, in doing that, I, I can't help but see universal appeal to some of yeah. the films on that list. You mentioned some of them already, Zulu, uh, Saving Private Ryan, uh, you know, plenty others there, the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, but you had Rob, Rob, uh, Roger Ebert react to this, right? <laughs> yes, he actually yes. re re reached out to you after you published this top 10 list. Well, I, so, so Roger Ebert, who I've, I've always greatly admired, uh, and I, I read a lot of film critic reviews, uh, Roger Ebert is the the godfather of the you know the film critic uh, industry. Sadly, passed away 
I think, uh, about a decade ago. And he, uh, he did respond, I, I think, publicly to this list of top 10 conservative films, and he disagreed with, with, with the list. But I was, just, I was just sort of, you know, bowled over the fact that he had actually read it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fact that he disagreed with it, it made no difference. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, um, but, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, films that can appeal to conservatives can appeal to liberals as well. Uh, and, you know, and one of the, the films that I mentioned on the list, Saving Private Ryan by Steven Spielberg, is a film that everyone should, uh, should, should watch. It doesn't matter what your polit politics are. It's a film for all Americans, for all Brits as well to, to, to watch and, and to, to appreciate. And, and I think Steven Spielberg, who is somebody who certainly is, is known as a very prominent liberal, but he's made many of the films that, you know, are, are in my view, the, the most inspiring uh, films of all time. And it doesn't make a difference to me, the politics of the director. If he makes, he or she makes a film that can inspire conservatives and liberals alike, then full power to them. You know, cinema, cinema is a uniting experience. And, and, and it should and, bring us all together. And, and even with The Crown, we see Peter, uh, you know, P Peter Morgan being uh, identified more as a, as a liberal writer, yeah. but yet this has wide appeal to both sides of the aisle. And, and even yes. us, you know, we, we don't politically agree on a lot of different things, but I know uh, getting a chance to have you in Erie, Pennsylvania in 2015, and then talking about film and talking about the filming of The Road, in Erie, Pennsylvania on the beach and the two of us taking a trip out to actually go see the scenes that were yes. shot. I know that's that's been the development of this relationship and something yeah. that we can certainly uh, agree upon and talk for days and days and days. And I, I that's uh, an, uh, a memory uh, I'll cherish. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful film The Road is. No, and absolutely. That, that's absolutely. a very inspiring, inspiring film as, film as well. And, and that, of course, was partly filmed in, in Erie, Pennsylvania. So uh, many thanks for giving me the opportunity to see the uh, the actual uh, location for for some key uh, scenes of of the road, and that that is a that's a very powerful movie. It really is. And Dr. Niall Garner, I could talk movies with you all night, but I know we are out of time here. So I want to stop and say thank you and invite you back again as soon as we can get you to Erie, Pennsylvania, take you to new film scenes, show you some developments that are happening, but continue the discussions that we have around politics and movies. So to our guest tonight, Dr. Niall Garner, director of the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights and your passion for cinema with us. Thank you, sir. Th thanks very much, Ben. It's been, been a great pleasure talking to you and to speak, speaking to the audience uh, tonight. I very much look forward to returning to Erie as, as, as soon as possible. Wonderful. We can't wait to get you here. And of course, thanks goes out to our entire JES team under the leadership of our president, Dr. Ferky Ferrati, who is excited to come and see you in Washington, D.C. when we can visit again with the Ramey Fellows with Dr. Roth as well, uh, sending his best. And I want to thank our team members to uh, Miss Angela Beaumont and Miss Olivia Wickline working behind the cameras with the audience and helping these programs really happen. I can't thank them enough. I can't thank Pat Cuneo for providing critical research and copious amounts of copy that goes into making the Global Summit happen. To Andy, to Charles, to Dia, to Brad and the rest of the JES team. And of course, to the JES Board of Trustees under the leadership of our chairwoman, uh, Joyce Savacchio, and to all of our event sponsors, Erie Insurance, Erie News Now, the Erie County Gaming Revenue Authority, WQLN Public Media, and the American Tapestry Project, and of course, the Global Summit event partner, the City Club of Cleveland. And of course, without you folks watching, thank you, thank you, thank you. Without you, none of these programs would be possible. The exchange of information and ideas would not be possible. So thank you for taking the time to join us here for Global Summit 12. Uh, of course, for more information about the JES, including how to register for additional Global Summit events, uh, which you see on your screen right now, two more weeks to go. This is the closeout of week one. We've got two more weeks ahead of us. Uh, do visit jeserie.org to register for these events. There you're also going to find videos of past presentations available to stream on demand and publications, including reports, essays, and timely writings, as well as information about other JES initiatives including our Civic Leadership Academy and aforementioned Ramey Fellows Program. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thank you for listening and learning with us.